<laughs> All right, so yeah, for the rare occasion, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, so <laughs> <laughs> we go a million directions here. Um, well, well, let's just give everybody your, your background story a little bit. Sure. Uh, my name is Rudy Reyes. Uh, my family is from South Texas. We're Latino. My father is from the border, uh, Rudy Reyes Sr., who gave me his name. He was a Marine in Vietnam and uh, enlisted. But my biological father is uh, Gustavo de la Yata, and he's actually Mexican, but of Spanish and European descent. He came from a very educated family, and, and he joined the Marine Corps as well. Uh, so interesting that these parallel lives and uh, how they intersect. I, I uh, later became a Marine and a recall Marine and fought overseas um, with the best and brightest of our generation. But, but it's so interesting. The loving father I had, the man that gave me his name, Rudy Reyes Sr., I only spent a few years with him before my family broke up. And he gave me his name, and I was not even his biological son. It's so special, and rest in peace. I love him and miss him very much, and I see some of the wisdom now that I am close to the age that he was when he passed. I understand what he was talking about in reflection. Uh, I have two little brothers, Michael and Caesar, and then and then later uh, Rudy Reyes Sr. had another family, and I have John Ray and Evangeline and little Dee Dee. So... Uh, because of poverty and my mother's family was, were, were they were migrant workers and laborers. Um, it was very poor. And after my family broke up, I found myself very young with my two little brothers on the border. We still had dirt floors and dirt roads. Yet, yet, um, it was some, some very happy things too. Uh, one of the walls, out, outer walls of the house, was, of the house was missing, and there's a canal, and, and we had an outhouse in the back, and it was kind of third world, right? Mm. It was third world, sure. But uh, it was also, it was also wonderful. So the first things I learned to do as a kid, I would go to, would be to go to the alley, and the first time I learned to throw a rock, really throw a rock at the stump out there and then chase little frogs in the canal um we played canicas which are marbles in in a circle dirt circle and um and uh the trompo was a wooden top so i wonder how many ki american kids have these experiences now probably not so i remember when i finally was adept enough at winding the top i was about th four years old three or four years old when i could finally spin that top and I remember my kind of upper class cousins that came to visit from Temple, Texas. They had Hot Wheels. I was just <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm missing out. I want some of these Hot Wheels. Yeah. Uh, so um, after uh, uh, some struggles and, and moving around and being shuffled around in South Texas, um, then we were, went to Kansas City. The same thing. We found ourselves in progressively poor and poor neighborhoods, um, inner city. Uh, a lot of uh, gang violence, um, uh, a lot of uh, drug uh, game going on with the black and the Latin communities there. And, and, uh, and, and we just started falling apart, going to worse and worse schools, fighting more and more. And this is also why when we look at your wall, this is why Muhammad Ali, Bruce Lee, John Rambo, um, Spider-Man, Wolverine, they, oh, I was always attracted to that icon of strength and heroism because I needed to find strength and heroism in my day-to-day because -day there was none out on those streets. Yeah. Eventually, we were, uh, were given up altogether by our mother, and we grew up in the Omaha home for boys. I ex now, how old were you when you went into that? Uh, 11. Okay. And myself, my two brothers, 11 or 12. Um we, we were very sick by then. Uh, we had worms, really bad worms, lice, and uh, my teeth had become so infected. I, I like smelled garbage every day, and it was the the sinus cavities of mine had, were so infected. It was smelling my the oh, rot of okay. it. And still, Jay, and still, I went uh, outside to the park across the street, and I did pull-ups and taught myself gymnastics every day and worked on myself the best I could every single day. And I've never stopped doing that. It's, it's, it's what has driven me always is because I believed in heroes. Uh, I excelled in wrestling and in sport, uh, and I played all the sports, but I liked wrestling and was best at wrestling, a combat sport. And then I got into boxing because I got beat up by a little black kid named 
uh, Gabriel Gordon in the boys' home. He had a little black kid from uh, Kansas City. He's like, hey, Rudy, you want to box? And I'm already undefeated eighth grade wrestler, strong, teeth fixed, antibiotics done, worms gone, nice haircut, a stud. I'm like, sure, I want to box. You know, I freaking fought in the streets already. I, I can whoop some ass. And so we put on the gloves, and this little black kid put on a tutorial <laughs> and just whooped my ass. And um, first, he just stuck. First, I was hitting him everywhere, but nothing was getting in. But I thought I was doing a lot of work. And he just stepped out and jabbed me. Bang! I was like, oh shit, this got serious. So then I came at him harder, and he covered up, slipped. Boom, uppercut once. My mouth started bleeding. I threw off my gloves. I'm like, we're going <laughs> to fight right now, you know. And uh, he's like, no, dog. I don't want to fight, dog. Yeah. I thought we was just boxing. After I calmed down, I went back to him. I said, hey, Gabe, could you teach me how to do that? So I started boxing with Gabe. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. When You know, when you see excellence and you see something that is uh, done with skill, and the truth is the truth. And he was the truth, so... Uh, I started w working on striking too, mostly just for me and to be strong, protect myself against uh, bullies, against tough guys, against any predator. And I had my two little brothers as well. Uh, I got out of the boys' home, and when I graduated high now, school, now Rudy was it was it fairly rough in the boys' home? Like were, yes, there, it was still there, rough. Uh, yeah. We it was in the inner city of Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. Um, yes, you had to compete and contest for everything. You okay. had to compete. I mean, it's all boys, all yeah. from rough backgrounds and sad backgrounds. Remember, we're young boys, and then the teens, and when you're a teenager and you're and you're thrown away, so I had to fight the bigger kids. Um, and it was violent sometimes. But eventually, like the military, there becomes a stasis, a, a, a pecking order and a rank structure. Um, and I just kept developing myself. And I was a painter and an illustrator. I got a shot at going to Kansas City Art Institute. And I, um, I was accepted. And, and uh, yet, I couldn't bring my little brothers to the barracks or the dormitory. And so I turned it down because I couldn't leave my little brothers. I couldn't leave them ethically. I couldn't leave them alone to grow up. I got them out and I got them in school. And the schools that we were able to go to in the inner city in Kansas City, Westport area at that time, the late 80s, early 90s, were infested with crack and uh, gun violence and gang violence every day, every night. They, are, they would not join the gang. There was pressure. And so I, I just couldn't let them grow up that way. So I had to say no to school, and I went to work and disciplined them at the YMCA. We went to the YMCA every day, and we washed dishes and bus tables, all three of us. And, and what was the age difference? Between? Uh, we're only a year, a year and a few months apart. Okay. But you know what? Me being, in a sense, their father might as well have been 20 years right. to me. And uh, Caesar and Michael, they're amazing little brothers, and... And um, they rebelled sometimes, and other times they listened to me, but they always worked out, and, and there was a martial art program um, downstairs. And my brother Caesar, the, the middle brother, uh, always a, uh, even more of a rebel than me. And he was a wrestler, and he was a gymnast as well. I always tried to get everybody work, uh, lifting weights. And he went downstairs, did a lesson of Kung Fu. That evening, he says, you know, there's martial arts downstairs, and this is what I learned. And, and he swept me, and he threw me. I was like, oh, wow. So that was it, man. After that, I started doing Chinese martial arts and martial arts in general, Eastern martial arts. And then later, you know, all martial arts. Uh, in the Marine Corps, we say one mind, any weapon. And, and now as we're older... Jay, we were really into performance and high evolutions of um, of um, of grace that happen through the quickening of sport. Athletics is the primal martial art. Athletics, so conditioning key. Nobody ever loses a fight and says, "Dang, I should have done more deadlifts." Mm. Dang, I should have freaking done Great more point. benches. Never, yeah, never happened. Yeah, so. Uh, that led me into a spiritual pursuit of Zen Buddhism and warrior ethos. I became a vegetarian. I fought at middle middleweight. Like are, are you still? No, okay. no, and now I'm definitely omnivorous. Yeah. Uh, Marine Corps cure, cur, cures you of yeah. any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Being hungry cures you of any of that <laughs> right, stuff. Right, right. So uh, because of those ethos, I excelled in martial art. It became more peaceful in every other way in my life. 
But that is what brought me to the Marine Corps. Hmm. I saw a documentary of children in an orphanage um, in the war in Kosovo when Yugoslavia fell apart and the sectarian violence and then the, uh, the ethnic cleansing of Serbians uh, or um, um, by Serbians. And, and I was compelled to do something about it because then I read the newspaper and President Clinton said that we we're going to put boots on the ground. And although I had no idea about using a weapon to kill anyone, Although I had no idea to hurt anyone, ethically, because I was a Zen Buddhist, I could not uh, let others go fight um, when my country has provided me so much um, wealth that I can pursue um, Zen Buddhism. I can pursue being a full-time martial artist, and and I can, uh, you know, I can pursue being happy. So that's why I joined the Marine Corps. I joined as an infantryman, and that kind of was what turned that next chapter from this peaceful warrior into a real combat professional. And Rudy, what were you doing uh, to make money at, at that time? Um, I was doing manual labor, uh, demolition, okay. uh, construction, and even in, like, everything was training for me. I only rode a bike. Yeah. Uh, I would. Um, I worked at a coffee house a couple times a, a week too, um, and then I was illustrating. Uh, I I met my my then wife Cherie. At, she was at the Kansas City Art Institute, and she was a brilliant designer. She graduated and became an art professional, and and then hired me to do all the illustrations because I'm really good at figurative work, and um, and so I'd illustrate the uh, package the package uh, or inside the packages the the construction little worksheet of putting the toys together for Tommy toys uh, of what to put where and stuff I illustrated all that and illustrated the people wow. do, yeah that was my thing so and it was really great money at the time it was like twenty dollars an hour or something like that I was like wow <laughs> so I was like man life is freaking fantastic I tell my wife that I want to join the Marine Corps she starts to cry right there um, but she could tell I loved it, and it called to me. And it's um, absolutely responsible for giving me the tools and the, the wealth of experience that I bring forward now. But it was at a cost, too, as everything is in life. Uh, and uh, f after I, I trained and worked to be somebody in a, um, in a very high echelon unit in the recon community, the reconnaissance communities, the special operations force of the Marine Corps at the time. There was 300,000 300, Marines, there was, and there were only 300 recon Marines yeah. around uh, at five different units. My unit was recon company at the time. It only had three platoons, 60 men. That's it. And you can imagine the competition. You can imagine how difficult it was. And... Uh, as I said to you before, my first year at the unit, 23 uh, recon marines died in training. That is There's crazy. So much uh, death in training because to keep that razor's edge of realistic tr training to prepare us to accomplish the mission and ultimately save and protect thousands of lives, yeah. it has to be on that edge. And there's always that inherent danger. So my first deaths of military men I witnessed at the unit and in training. And there was a lot of it. Uh, now, what happens inside you the, the first time you see a guy that's just in training? I mean, this isn't even yeah, a battle. Yeah. And, you know, some um, and some of these are my brothers, older brothers. I mean, they were my mentors. Um, do, do any guys tap out at that point? They're like, oh, this is insane? Or? You know what? I guess it'd be like super high-end uh, sport athletics. If you've been groomed and committed for a whole lifetime yeah. to be in the big show... Not too many, n n very few tap out, yeah. some damn sure self-destruct. Yeah. yeah. And we see that yeah. as a, we, we see the parallels in the sport world and in the soft, the special operations uh, mm -hmm. forces community. We see those parallels. Uh, yes. So it's it, a self-destruct. Um, uh, yet, I will say also, my, my unit, Recon Company and Recon Battalion here in California, um, first, they, it was a family I'd never had. I, this is the first time I had fathers. It's the first time I had fathers um, since my dad when I was three. And they were you know, amazing. 
They gave me more love than anything I'd ever experienced in the world, including my wife. But it was at a price. You had to run the fastest, swim the fastest, fight the hardest, be the best every day. But if you could do that, and you know, as young men, we, we are designed to do that, then you're given grace and love and glory. And when you got that freaking candy on your chest, when you have that dual cool, you got those freaking uh, jump wings and that dive bubble, even when you're a lance corporal or corporal. Um, and I'm a scout sniper as well, the most prestigious freaking sniper program in the world. Uh, when I'm walking on main side and even when, you know, when I'll salute a captain going by, the captain always gives me a wide berth. He's like, fuck, that's a recon Marine right there. Like everybody gives you love and respect. It was a level of respect I'd never felt before. So it was intoxicating. Yeah. And then, so, so yeah, I think you, you said you trained for three or four years before yes. going into battle. <clears throat> yes. I was, um, I was on the 15th Mew and we were the, the, fur, the quick reaction force in the Persian Gulf to fly and fight into Pakistan and into Afghanistan after the towers fell. So we, uh, as we speak now, we have two Mews, uh, Marine Expeditionary Units on a MAGTAF, or with, and it's a MAGTAF, Marine Air Ground Task Force, um, with a Navy flotilla called an ARG, Amphibious Ready Group. As we speak now, uh, uh, around the patrolling the oceans, in the globe right now ready to go if something happens and and so uh, you do not need a act of congress uh, the congress doesn't have to vote on it or anything like that you can send us in for i think 90 days while while our country scrambles and if you recall you're an east coast guy you call the 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 pain the, the anger the rage um and the uh, the uh, the tears uh, yeah. after September 11th oh, yeah. and and we were the first ones in, man. And we started rocking and rolling in, in Pakistan, doing counter sniper, uh, ki- counter recon patrols to prepare um, a, a whole co- 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 what do you call them? coalition forces. Uh, we had we had Germans, we had Aussies, we had we had uh, Norwegians, we had um, uh, British to get all of our assets into a place called Camp Rhino and take Kandahar. Kandahar. In Afghanistan, that is named after Alexander, Kandahar's Alexander. And that's the furthest that Alexander was able to conquest. And um, it was, man, it was just steeped in freaking history there, man. Uh, we were going to meet with Masood, the, the warrior lion of the Northern Alliance. And he was, he was assassinated days before we were linking up with him. I mean, this is crazy times. Um, after an interdiction, a, um, a prisoner was handed over to us that was wounded and he looked like Mujahideen. He looked Af- like he was Afghan and it was, uh, Johnny Walker Lind. It was, uh, it was that American. I, I heard, um, when I was outside of the Connex box guarding him after this hit, I heard, this guy, I heard a voice saying, man, I'm so hungry. You know, could you? I thought it was one of my homeboys. It was, I thought it was yeah. one of my teammates around the Connex box, uh, like throwing his voice. I didn't imagine it's the freaking guy inside the freaking box. Yeah. And it was some really wild times. I was very focused on my mission. I was a, I was a point man at that time. AJ Hole was my team leader. I was just doing what I was told and taking every mission we could. And it was very dangerous. But when we came back home, I thought, wow, man. I lived, we lived, we did well. Um, and how, how long were you there the first time? I think nine months. Okay. Nine months. And, and it, but it was only, as we would know later, the beginning mm. in Iraq. And then I went back for the invasion of Iraq, which I'm, I'm known for in Generation Kill because Generation Kill was made by HBO after the book of Evan Wright. And he wrote articles in Rolling Stone first called The Killer Elite. And by the way, he got that name from me, The Killer Elite. So old James Kahn, um, um, CIA slash Kung Fu film made in like 73 in in San Francisco with a young Robert Duvall as well. It was uh, called The Killer Elite. So I didn't know it would be a huge success or anything like that. I was still in the Marine Corps, still a recon Marine. I'm a team leader. I'm seasoned. I have to take a team out to Fallujah and Ramadi, which is a bloodbath. It was a uh, it was a meat grinder that many that have not been there. They, they can't comprehend it. Helmand would be similar. Afghanistan and Helmand province would be similar uh, later. 
Um, but it was continuous operations day and night, and it was absolutely savage. And it was who could be more professionally savage and be more disciplined. Um, that's that's where the victory would go. And I was eating chow. I mean, it's so wild, Jay. These these historic events that I happen to find myself in the middle of. I was eating chow with those contractors at a place called the Viper ASP while I was doing a lo- uh, left seat, right seat with an airborne unit, an Army airborne unit. I'm not sure. If, I think it was 101st, and we were replacing them, and they were shell-shocked. Um, uh, IEDs, um, uh, continuous guerrilla attacks, and they were overwhelmed and so they brought in freaking 1st Recon Battalion as the new sheriffs in town to lock down Fallujah. And um, I was eating chow in the morning with th- those contractors that were later hanging from that bridge that day. While my unit got chopped CAG, uh, Delta Force, to do sniper in a blocking position while they did a hit. And there's a little bird above me shot right out of the sky by a heat-seeking missile from the enemy. I mean, this is a kind. Of, this is the, the armaments and the level of uh, violence and the teeth that our enemy had then. So um, it was blood and guts continuously. Uh, we did every kind of operation you can imagine. We had, uh, our unit did jump inserts. I did helo inserts. I did spider holes. Um, I, I did countless sniper missions. Um, Uh, overt, covert patrolling continually, um, uh, demolition and explosives missions. And it culminated with my platoon being chopped to the Green Berets and with assets from the triple letter agencies, Shark Base in Ramadi to be their hunter-killer unit um, of an operation called Trojan Horse. So I looked like I look now uh, then. And because I'm Latino, I I could pass as a Pakistani worker, um, um, a foreign national. Right. And we would drive out of the, I would drive out with my team in the back seat and the, the, the backs cut out so that my machine gunner can hide back there. We've got cut off teams hiding in tractor trailer trucks, close air support. But I would be the bait for the insurgents to come try to kill me, capture me and cut my head off. And why we were doing this is to draw them out so we kill them close quarters, close as we are right here, at this close, brother, pu- putting freaking men on the ground and putting bullets in their head and then hitting the clock three minutes on them for sensitive site exploitation and, and gleaning all comms and everything we could get and doing signals intelligence on those that we hit and then hitting them, uh, raiding their houses at night, four in the morning, and we broke up massive terrorist networks. The Naji brothers went down. We did some immense stuff, but it took so much continuous overt and covert work. And when I was not on a mission, Jay, I made my team lift weights with me and run in the freaking desert, and we never stopped training. When I was not on a mission, I was running observation exercises and uh, close air support exercise. It was continuous. Um, it was my entire existence. My my brother, one of my brothers lost his arms. Another brother was killed. A few other brothers were wounded. My brother Eric Cucker was wounded, and it took it, it took uh, it turned me to something way more uh, deadly. And uh, well, I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit. When, when you say it was continuous, was part of that a coping mechanism? Like, if I stop, I'll be I think thinking so. about all this too much. I think you're right. I, I, at the time, I didn't imagine that. So, y- yes, Chase, I, I also did this. I did not let my teammates go to the internet center and mm. uh, reach out to their wives or families, except once a week. I kept their head in the game. I think it was absolutely. Yeah. I could only be in one place at a time, right? And I realized when my men from my other teams my brothers were wounded and killed and um and then i saw also the 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 immense uh violence and carnage of what the iraqi people were doing to themselves too i knew that the only way is complete absolute commitment and a total immersion and i didn't know if i was going to live or die i took every suicide mission i could most of the people we were killing at first with, with Trojan horse were police and uh, later Iraqi soldiers. I was in a freaking hell. I was in a hell that many people can't, just can't comprehend. But I brought my team home, home alive. Um, and they went on to do great things too. Uh, 
but but then some did not. Um, there, there's there's an off gas and an after effect, uh, a price for for glory and a, a, a price for dominance. And in, I think Nietzsche said, "In times of peace, a man of war will turn upon himself." And that's more true now than ever. And I'm trying desperately to change that narrative for my community and it had to start by changing that narrative for myself and that's what i've been doing wow um i don't know if you're comfortable discussing this or, or not uh can you talk a little bit about you know when you notice kind of things changing for you and you're like well i'll never be the same again based on what i'm doing and what i'm seeing and well when i saw some i saw some looking back i saw the red flags at the time no I was immersed in that culture of recon and of swift, silent, and deadly. And um, uh, constant engagement with physical, mental, and spiritual limits. So it, your personal life blurs. You as a person, as a being, has to submit. I was then Sergeant Reyes. I was then team leader. It's no longer Rudy. So, because um, they both can't exist at the same time when you're in a place of life and death. And seeing, uh, I, well, I just started becoming more and more dead to the uh, carnage, uh, sadness of the ambient culture, the people in squalor, my men, uh, my men on the edge always, and all of us always excited to kill, all of us excited to find the enemy and kill them. Um, on our off time, I would run them in the desert. My, my young ATL, uh, McCoy, at the end of the deployment, I ran us all so hard, his nose is pouring out blood. It's so freaking fierce and hot and dry out there. It, it took that total commitment to, um, looking into oblivion on a daily. So I didn't notice that I changed then. I didn't think it was my right to speak on it. I was not even yeah. interested. I, I didn't even think I rated to speak on any issues I had. Yeah. That is how indoctrinated and conditioned we become for the collective. But without that, then it all falls apart. Mm. So it wasn't until I, I got home and first I was a workaholic and distanced myself from Cherie. Um, there was one, the first thing I knew something was weird is I was always meticulously working on my gear all the time. And it might have been between the invasion of Iraq and Fallujah. Because the invasion was bloody as hell too. And you, you watch Generation Kill. That's some, only one month of fighting. But we were, we were rocking and rolling and killing every freaking day. And... Uh, and it was, it, I swear I did not sleep for two weeks straight. The first two weeks I did not sleep once. You can't. There's no way. There's no way. And, and you're constantly moving. And we were ahead of all armor and tanks. We were ahead of every unit. We were 30 kilometers ahead of everybody just uh, attacking towns and, and being the freaking spearhead. And um, I was working on my gear. And Cherie said, baby, would you like some... You want rice and beans with, with, you know, with the fish, or do you want vegetables? And I'm working on my gear, and she asked me again. I said, I don't fucking care. You just do it. Or, I, I don't fucking care. And I never used to talk like this. Mm. It's like, I, I don't fucking care. You know, I'm fucking working right now. Well, a few minutes go by, and I just noticed really quiet. And I get up, and I walk around the little corner where the little kitchen is in Oceanside where we lived, and my wife is crying. And she's crying and she says, um, I, and the first thing I said is, what the fuck's wrong with you? What do you got to cry about? You know, like, do you know what the fucking world's like out there? And she says, well, well I've, you've, Rudy, you've never made a single decision in this house about anything. All you, all you do is go fight and come back. Go fight and come back. You've never made a single decision that has to do with you and me. Seven years. And 
And I didn't get emotional like I am now. It was fucking locked off. And then a few days after that, we were going to the gym. Or this is after I came back from Fallujah. We were going to the gym. Someone took my parking spot and I almost killed a father and son with my bare hands because I was conditioned that I cannot let anybody dominate me. And my wife's screaming and crying and telling me to stop. And then the violence progressed and I started fighting more in the street and there was no amount of training and work that I could do, no amount of achieving that was that was uh, taking that pressure off. And, um, and it just continued. And then I got into film and television and they utilized this great energy I have and this freaking rage I have and it's very productive, pointed in a, in a direction. But in lieu of, a, of having a direction, in lieu of having a job in between projects, I was just self-destructing. Um, and I just thought there was no way out. And I just thought, thought uh, eventually I'd, I'd be killed or I'd kill somebody and go to prison. Or, or I also always thought about suicide too. I always thought about going to, because I was living in Southern California, just going to the ocean at night and swimming as far as I can until I can't swim anymore and just dying out there and nobody's got to see me no more. On the outside, I presented really well, but inside Did, I was did you come dying. close to doing any of those things? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a pistol in my mouth before and... I was very close. Um, I later, you know, I I suffered losing my my children, my son, for some time. I had to be in court for a long time. I was hurting really bad and uh, abusing so hard drugs and alcohol every day if I was not on a mission. On a mission, perfect. I was right back to being myself again, what I knew who, who I was. But if I was not, I could not handle day-to-day life. Um, and yet I still had responsibilities, but soon those things started failing too. Soon my work performance started failing. Soon everything started failing, and I didn't know what to do. There was nobody to talk to back then. Nobody was talking about anything back then, and there was not enough data. Nobody understood that you know all my the times the fucking vehicle has been hit with f- fucking ieds or mortars all the times i've sh- freaking shot rockets and all the times i've you know the, the massive trauma of of of, of 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 violence and warfare warfare uh that it, it takes a toll on the brain on the body uh and then left without treatment it'll it'll take a toll on your on your very soul and we can't let that happen anymore i'm committed completely committed to turning that around and i still had a hard time like last night i drank too much and i i got really upset and uh, i was with my other marine corps brothers and when i turned the corner and had too many tequilas and i'm with the brother that i fought in the invasion with all those fucking memories come back like and then also the shame and anger that, that as great as I was at one time, how, how, um, how I feel like a failure sometimes now, and all of those things, and um, so I still fight it. It's a lot better now. I have a lot more tools, and I have a beautiful, beautiful support structure and family now that helps me through it. I have a mission with Force Blue. I have my own success. I'm working, and I'm, I'm modeling, and and filming, and writing, and and doing so much, but still, it is a daily battle until I, until I really come home. Then I realize it's not just me when I'm working with all these other brothers and sisters out there. Um, we, uh, I may have left Afghanistan and Iraq. I may have left Northeast Africa, but they have not left me yet. So I'm unpacking all that. I realize it's, you don't unpack it just one time. You're going to unpack it for a long time. I, I am, uh, I've done so much work at unpacking it. I'm finally getting somewhere. Um, and and in expressing these things, Jay, I hope that our audience, especially those tough men and women holding that line, can hear me and something will stick. So when they find themselves going through a hard time, they'll understand that the isolation kills and um, wellness of mind, body and spirit, physical exercise is the best medicine for what's happening in our heads and in our brain. We are not crazy. We're just affected from immense experiences, sacred experiences too, and profane. 
do not isolate, reach out. You have yeah. people like me and so many of us out here that love you and that you're not a failure. It is critical that they understand this. And I had to understand it myself or else I would be in the grave. Yeah. You know? And, and men in general are taught that showing vulnerability is, is weakness, but it's yes. really not. No, it's not. It's the ultimate courage. Yeah. It's, the ultimate, it's the ultimate bravery and courage. Uh, I have a therapist. I, I work with Dr. Carrie Elk. Uh, she's part of our team with Force Blue. And for the audience, Force Blue is... Yeah, I was uh, going to say, t tell us all about that. Sure. Oh, my gosh, man. This is, the, this is my legacy. This is how I've turned uh, the warrior ethos now into one day. I will uh, imagine Wikipedia and Rudy Reyes in a couple years. And the first thing, it doesn't say recon marine or, or um, war hero or actor. It says the first thing says conservationist. I mean, think about that. Think about what that freaking um, represents. To become not a, wap a weapon of mass destruction, but now a weapon of mass creation. Uh, I had this dream when Jim Ritteroff and Keith Somm brought me down to Cayman Islands and I was in a rough way and I had only ever used the ocean as a method of insertion and an extraction and to, um, and to infiltrate, to locate clothes with and destroy my enemies. To, to use it as a way to cloak myself so I could be a better killer for my team, for my unit so that we can continue to be excellent and so we hold our prestige so we always push all of our equipment underneath the water. You got battle dress uniform, your fighting kit, your weapon system, your freaking gear. Once we get to the freaking high water mark, and this is all in the cover of darkness. Sometimes, you know, out of a bird, freaking uh, uh, over the horizon, zodiacs for hours, and then deploying uh, five, six kilometers out, and pushing and navigating subsurface in the darkness. And then when those waves are crashing over you and you're sitting down and you're squeezing your teammates' arms and you're touching each other's masks, you're getting everybody ready and you're tearing off the freaking pantyhose on your weapon system that keeps all the silt out and you're putting on your packs as the waves, you're looking at the waves crashing over you right here and you're getting everything ready, getting your fins off, clipping them in, getting off your buddy lines and then boom, you come out of that water with those guns up in case there's bad guys, you gotta freaking chop your way through, you're still on oxygen and then you freaking go back out to the submarine or whatever. Um, that was my ocean experience. It was a part of my war craft. When I went to Cayman Islands, this is the first time I really was diving during the daytime and got to look at all the beautiful fish and this community underneath the water. And I was just marveled and transfixed by this teeming freaking aquarium of, of life and beauty and every little being down there. I'm really spiritual, so I see these little animals as beings. No one's taking more than they need. Everyone is involved in eating and making kids and, um, and balancing the ecosystem. And I, I, uh, I started calming down. My anxiety started going away. I had really bad anxiety. I've had really bad anxiety for the last 10 years. I started going away. I started changing. I started healing. And Jim and Keith said that all oh, this reef is going away. The, the cruise liner industry is ripping this reef out to put in this big uh, harbor. Um, and, and then because of uh, climate change and pollution, we're destroying the reefs around the world. And uh, I knew that I have to do something to, about this because those beings down there in that community deserves to be protected. And they can't fight for themselves. This is why I joined the Marine Corps. I went to go fight for those children in Kosovo. And so that's, that's what I did, brother. And I started thinking about it. And my first idea, though, because I love it crazy, I thought, okay, I'm going to talk to my homeboys, all my freaking teammates, and we're going to get some explosives together. And we're just going to blow up a couple of ships and some harbors. And then they're not going to be able to mess with these dang reefs. <laughs> yeah, that was my first thinking, right? And then my homeboy, and then my, my co-founders, Keith Somm and and Jim Ritteroff were like, whoa, 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 you know, pump the brakes, hard charger, yeah. pump the brakes. Uh, maybe there's another way. Um, uh, what if we could, uh, there's, Rudy, there's ways to rebuild the reefs. I said, what, really? Yes, there's ways to be, rebuild them, but it's very arduous, arduous work, and it's very tough because you're in very extreme conditions with surf and destruction from hurricanes and, um, 
and it's painstaking work if you're growing the reefs in a water column and then you have to replant them we have to do hydrographic surveys and i'm like well hydrographic surveys this is what i know how to do what what if we did something like that with my teammates what if we got the brothers together and uh, all of us undersea commandos and we could we could be a, a force for good underneath the water and jim and keith said man that's awesome and um uh, they said, well, Rudy, I've seen what it, they told me. Well, we've seen what this has done for you. We ought to do this full time. And I said, I'm all in. So together, so we cool. created, isn't it, it yeah. rad? Yeah. And this was a dream three years ago. Now we've accomplished four missions. We've been fully operational for a year. We're still raising money. So we need you all to go on forcebluteam.org, um, donate and share. Uh, ultimately, our vision is to have corporate, massive corporate sponsorship so that uh, we can do this full time around the world because the missions are, are there and they need us. We've been in D.C. continuously and they have missions all over the world and other governments. Um, their precious resource for tourism is these beautiful oceans and the reefs. They need us too. There's so many missions, but we still are raising money. Uh, and still we've done it. Still we've done it. I mean, they said something like a, the Marine Corps can do the impossible with nothing forever, right? Well, with that gung-ho attitude, uh, that's what we've done with Force Blue, and I have teammates from every uh, major br or every branch of the U.S. military, SEALs, pararescuemen, um, Green Berets, uh, Recon Marines, MARSOC. We've got an amazing British Royal Marine Commando, John Schlayer. We have uh, brothers in Australia, Egypt, um, and in... Uh, Greece that are all and Italy all want to go get on the team. I mean, we have so many uh, resumes. We have hundreds of brothers and sisters that want to get on. Wow. So now I'm making a, another schoolhouse in Cayman Islands, August, mid August. We graduate in Key Largo, August 24th, and that's team two. And then we're slotted to do a, a, to train up with these prestigious reef scientists and the very best and the brightest in the worlds of undersea conservation to do another school in February. I want to see this grow exponentially well we can put you know our 20,000 combat divers since 9-11 utilize those skills and uh, utilize that uh, preciously uh, gained experience and and millions of dollars that's been put into us in a way to rebuild and protect a, a coral reefs and, and a community that needs us I see a children's program down the road I see uh I see doing documentary film work and television series in which we travel and show how precious and how important for economy, and this is what people will understand more. Economically, we need these reefs. They produce 63% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, for ecotourism, we need these reefs. M many of our, our bioscience and uh, medic medicine comes from reefs. Um, this, uh, uh, without this uh, amazing undersea world, when the blue dies, the green follows right after. If we lose these reefs, we lose the rest of the planet. We'll get people thinking about it, talking about it, doing something about it. We can start changing things about the plastics we use, about the the sunscreen that we use that when we go into the ocean uh, comes off and kills and blocks. The, uh, wow, yes, right? yes, yeah. everything. We can start. Yeah. And now, now people are like, Rudy, you, you're you're dreaming too big. You, how can you possibly do this? Do you remember, Jay, when when nobody believed Americans would recycle and sort their trash? Well, you know what? We do that now. I know we can do the same thing yeah. to, to protect and preserve uh, the coral reefs and, and our oceans. We have been um, we've been approached to do conservation work with the sea turtles, with sharks. Now the United States Navy and the Army Corps of Engineers has approached Force Blue to to go to the Battle of Midway and recover remains of dead servicemen and women. Uh, I mean, this is just immense. It's only the very beginning. And, and that's, that, that transcendence that Force Blue has done to me, I'm seeing it in all my teammates, and I'm seeing it happen to everybody involved with me and my Well, people. your passion about it is so contagious and so Thanks, inspiring. Man. And I would imagine once you start talking about it and sharing the mission with, with other people, they yeah. want to jump on board. Oh, right? it's so cool. You know yeah. what? It's so wild. You know, uh, a lot of us tough dudes in, in 
military and in sports and then you know i'm from the midwest people from the south and even people from the east coast they say to people in the west coast they're so shallow they're so fake and and um and nobody really cares i'll tell you by being in film and television and me having some notoriety in veteran community and being on tv and 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 being a figurehead i've brought in artists filmmakers musicians who have donated big time. Uh, I'm bringing the art community and the science community, which traditionally is on the opposite end of the spectrum of military. We're yeah. creating a bridge for both, for all. And it's inclusive. It's not exclusive. Betterment, buoyancy, belonging. That is what we're doing with our individuals and our teammates. And we're, I think we're going to do it for the world. Wow. So inspiring. Thanks. So I can't cool. wait for you to see the video. Uh, yeah. I'll send you okay. our, our two-hour documentary. Okay. You can watch it on your big screen. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. When you see my teammates and what we've been through and what we're doing now, yeah, you, you're going to be moved. It'll change your life. And uh, and it's, it's so absolutely life forward. Not post-traumatic stress, but post-traumatic growth. That's where we're at. Love it. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, what's next for you in, in Hollywood and entertainment. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, bless uh, Rick Elder uh, from from uh, from Beyond Clothing and and then my mentors at 511, um, Eric Katzenberg, and, of course, Tom Davin, the president of Recon Marine. Very, very prestigious company, 511, and they're down in, in, um, in Orange County. Uh, I started modeling for them and doing commercials and then working with other people and learning a business acumen. Uh, I've had people like Bert Soren in the sport community. I've had brothers in arms like um, like Brandon Lilly and Derek Woodski, um, uh, Belisa uh, and Jen Wiederstrom. It's so wild. It, we have so much in common uh, as athletes, as warriors, and as truth seekers. We all are helping each other because we need each other. I talked to you earlier about how we all have to climb our own mountains, and some of us are absolute mountain climbers, mountain climbers of life. Well, oftentimes we climb them alone, and it's filled with peril, and it's dangerous, and some, and some don't make it back. But those that make it to the top, you get to the top, and you see everybody else that's on top of their mountains too, and that becomes your circle of iron, your your nights of the round table. And that's what I'm finding, Jay. I mean, you know, just hanging with you at, at Summer Strong and and with the other fellas and the other ladies that are just freaking masters of their craft and master human beings. Yeah. It's it's been a ripple effect. It's again that water. Uh, and a shout out to um, to Wallace J. Nichols. Um, he wrote Blue Mind and he's on our board with Force Blue. And um, he speaks on the proximity to water and look where you live brother the proximity to water the human organism thrives there's something to that i mean our right. bodies are 93 percent water right. your ocean right here that freaking calm and love and power you feel every day the negative ion uh, known as chi yeah. every morning that's why training in the morning out here is so amazing uh it just quickens all your cells um that ripple effect's happening for us and ourselves, and it starts small, but it can, it can reach the whole world, and uh, and I believe in it, and I'm doing it. I love it. Uh, let's just talk, talk oh, about. Oh yeah! Oh, yep. that's right. I got some freaking movies and TV stuff. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm blessed with uh, another amazing professional in the filmmaking world. His name is uh, Henry Alex Rubin. Henry is a very, very mild-mannered on the outside Frenchman that grew up also in New York. No trace of a French accent, but boy, can he freaking um, uh, speak some freaking French like nobody's business here when he's throwing it down. He's so amazing. And he's very quiet, very collected, and he's been my friend through Alexander Skarsgård. Uh, again, people think that that actors, um, musicians, artists, or people who work in entertainment business 
that it's all about themselves. I have some very prestigious, loving people in that community. And Alex has always been, he's kind of by proxy been my agent. Um, he's got me so much work. He put me in contact with Henry Alex Rubin. I worked with him for a couple of years just as an advisor. When he'd call me, I'd give him advice about what he was going to do with this military project. Uh, a year ago, he calls me and says, I've got the Marine Corps Super Bowl commercial, Rudy. I would like you to be my military advisor. I need your help with this, this, and this. I end up casting it, uh, doing ad hoc assistant directing. I run this amazing commercial that was at the, on the, you know, premiered at the Super Bowl, and, and it was so rad. Uh, and I, it made my self-esteem so good. Henry then did another movie, and we just wrapped it a few months ago, uh, ago called Semper Fi, about Marine Corps reservists. And I, br I was brought on as a military advisor. I helped with the writing, and then I acted in it too, and that'll be coming out later this year. Um, now I'm working on another big, big movie. I can't tell you what it is, but I will tell you it's going to be shooting in Spain, and it's a $100 million picture, yeah. and it's the big time. So I made a, my own company with my fellow recon brother. I partnered up with my fellow recon brother, who is such a force multiplier on Semper Fi. His name is Chris Joliet. He is... Uh, He's an undercover narcotics officer and a recon scout sniper in the reserves and a platoon sergeant. I mean, this guy just is always cleaning weapons, putting steel on steel, lifting weights, and giving back to the community in every way he can. Uh, we're going to do more and more of this, advising uh, film and television, putting our brothers like Sergio Bernal and, and Jack Marillo, other actors that are coming up from the Marine Corps and other branches of service, I see our work ethic, our camaraderie, our ethos, and our can-do attitude as such a force multiplier in this industry. I'd like to see us all do so much more. And so our company's name is Jack of All Trades, um, uh, LLC, and that's that's the, um, the the insignia that we have, a Jack of All Trades. You see the diver, the jumper, the... the um, the paddle from our World War II raider um, uh, inception, um, the skull that represents mortality of both ourselves and the enemy, and then the three bullet holes represent pain, misery, and suffering, and that's what you must expect on every mission. The crack represents the willingness to drive on no matter what. And then, of course, the Marine Corps K-Bar, the fighting knife in the Marine Corps. It's a jack of all trades because they're perishable skills. You must constantly hone, be mm. in a state of, of, of constant honing in perfection like the samurai like the hagakuri the samurai code we made a company we're working on this great movie and i'll tell you more later when we link up later i'll tell you off camera it's so rad and um, and i'm just trying to continue to be that force of good and give opportunities to my loved ones and the best and brightest in our country these young people that have served and done so much and now just need some um, they just need some mentorship some of the mentorship i wish i would have had and they're going to knock it out of the park. I can't wait to know the new Rudy Reyes is in 10, 15 yeah. years that are going to be, you know, I'm going to be old by then. <laughs> and uh, I'll be on like the board of the company. And, you know, I'll be seeing these young hot shots kicking ass. And uh, as Wes Whitlock, another entrepreneur, rogue American apparel, he was a Marine, brilliant, an artist and a hell of a businessman. He told me a few years ago, Rudy, I love planting seeds and and when the rains come and just seeing them grow. And that's what I love to do with the people around me. I just plant some seeds and I feel the same way now too. So it's pretty cool, huh? Super cool. Now you, you've alluded to how you like to always be in your free time, working on your body, working on your mind. You showed up here with your, with your Soar Neck Center Mass Bell, you know suspension trainer. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what your training is like, um, you know, the specifics of your training and, and, and why it's so important to you to continually Huh. Well, you know what? The specific, the specifics really are that it's never too specific. Um, but you do something every day. I do, but there's so. I think of three things: um, skill sets, talent based, um, i.e., um, strength, mostly strength, and um, um, hardware. Uh, maintenance, mm -hmm. hardware, a uh, hard word assessment and maintenance, and then the third thing, third thing, um, VO two max conditioning, uh, work rate. I sometimes do a little of all three together, or sometimes just work on uh, one of the three. Uh, skills can be my swimming, running, uh, shooting, climbing, martial arts. Those are skills, and that'll keep you fit. Yeah. Then you got the iron game, 
with um, your basic um, uh, Olympic lifts, power lifts, and but I'll tell you, really, I do much lighter loads off center. Kettlebell and center mass bell are my primary because it requires so much recruitment and checking in with proper body structure, i.e. Chris Frankel, another great coach. If you have not been freaking Frankelized, man, Coach Frankel is no joke, position of strength, alignment, um, and that's a piece. And then we've got freaking straight up VO2 max conditioning, um, Sprint, sprint uh, hills with, uh, I call it the assault on my soul bike, um, rowers, um, skiers, um, um, rope work, uh, leaping knees to chest, boss routines, freaking 30 minute workout, which is a legend. Uh, so th- those three things, uh, sports, um, sport VO2 max slash athletic um, work rate stuff, hardware stuff. Skill stuff. Sometimes I mix them. Yeah. Depending if I'm in the environment. Like when I'm at freaking Sorenex, they got everything there for me. So I'm able to do everything. Sports, VO2 max, uh, get stronger, build some freaking stronger connective tissue. Um, and, uh, and you know, I'm able to, to, you know, make that amalgamation other times depending on my environment because I'm always traveling. Yeah. And so oftentimes my environment dictates, man, okay. I see that pill out, that pool out there. That pool looks awesome. So when I come back, brother, I gotta you gotta let me go hit that pool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have my swim paddles with me. So oh, that's another thing. I bring my center mass belt uh, from Sorenex. And, and you travel that on a plane and everything. I do, I do. I used to uh, check or I bring it on with me, but then they thought it was like a bomb because it looks right. like a cannonball. Yeah. So I check it. It's fifty pounds, so it doesn't okay. cost you extra to check. Uh, it's right there at the limit. Okay. Um, I bring a suspension trainer, so I can always do pull ups, rows, push ups, uh, knee work. Uh, another shout out, you ought to look into Pat McNamara. He is like, like, he's like what I will be in 10 years. Super functional, even though it's a totally overused word. I would say applicable strength, uh, uh, tire work, you know, gymnastics. I still do a lot of gymnastics. Um, so I have my suspension trainer, my center mass belt, and then my swim paddles mm. because I believe that swimming. Again, that propensity of health that is uh, that happens to people in water, it just freaking nothing is like it for me. Yeah. Better, it feels so awesome, and so that's that's my gym. I bring my center mass belt, suspension trainer, and some pedals. And how long do you spend per day doing that kind of stuff? Uh, sometimes I have a freaking uh, free for all smorgasbord of training. Like when I'm at store next, we'll do that freaking six seven hours all yeah. day. Yeah. And then other times I take days off. If I go super intense, I notice some of it's my. Um, it's probably just age too. I'm 46. I'll be 47 in December. I perform best with an hour, hour and a half. Oh, and by the way, before I even start, I pace. I pace for 10, 15 minutes. Just pace and listen to Eric Thomas. Okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. I can. I will. I must. Right? Uh, yeah. what, and what else? He's like, what do you say? No alarm clock needed. My passion wakes me up. I will yeah. pace, listen to him. Yeah. Then move into my uh, workout portion, which is I do a warm up workout, mm. uh, mostly body weight. Then the iron and and or apparatus, and then an afterburner 10 minute. And I guess it keeps me really lean, keeps my muscles growing. Uh, and if I go super intense or I'm working on a, a skill slash um, hardware work like Olympic lifts, I take the day, sometimes two days off. Okay. But then again, I never really take days off because I'm always on the road. Yeah. I got to carry that dang center mass belt with me around the airport everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, you saw me. I, can't, I mean, so yeah. I always got my ruck on and I right. always got my kit. So I'm always moving. But I do notice that, uh, that that's the best medicine for my mind and yeah. my body. When yeah. my body is dormant too long, it hurts. For sure. When it's, when it's moving, it feels great. Yeah. And what's your diet like? Well, I eat, uh, I eat as an opportunist. Um, I used to be much more strict. Now, you know what? This is so wild. I got, I got to be, got to be straight with you. Part of the reason I resist the modern uh, nutrition trends, mm-hmm. first of all, they're mostly gimmicks anyway. Yeah. Um, 
because I have witnessed and been in places of uh, abject poverty and starvation, and because I know that 90% of the world has no access, probably 95% of the world, if we look population, has, has no access to the super high end whole foods right. and, and, and the, um, the supplements and all of that, and damn sure not the performance enhancing drugs. I ethically like to stay with my people and my people is the human race. And so, uh, so, so I, uh, I just eat and try to take the minimum I can from this world. I, I just really do. Um, I just take the minimum. Now, when I'm training really, really intense, I notice I'm much, I'm much more hungry, especially at night. I primarily eat at night after my day of work is done. Sometimes I will have a, a small meal in the afternoon because I've already trained during the day. I remember I'm on the computer, I'm on meetings, or I'm doing an audition. Um, and then at night, I eat dinner. But then, as but after dinner, I'll eat again probably around 2300 at 11 o'clock. And then I'll wake up at about four in the morning hungry and eat some more peanut butter and freaking cold cuts. Yeah. I'll eat some turkey and some peanut butter yeah. and then crow, crash out. Yeah. And then I wake up. And so my, my food's had some time to digest. And then I wake up and attack the day. Okay. So that's kind of how I do it. Gotcha. <laughs> do you have any uh, anything specific you do for recovery or anything like that? Well, I damn sure roll the hell out of my body out, uh, yeah. now. Um, I definitely need some more um some more body work. These lovely people. I don't know if you know the people at Deuce Gym. Yeah. Um, uh, Lindsay, uh, Birth Fit. She, uh, she, I was going to go train with her today, but my body's still recovering from that freaking 17 hour China mm. f- flight from China. And in my hip, and I got in a fight a couple days ago. My quadriceps was a little bit freaking hurt. I don't know how it got hurt, but I was fighting. And, uh, and it was with my recon brother. We're both okay now. Um, but, um, I'm going to go to a massage place called Raven Spa. Yeah. Right around. Okay. Yeah, so right I'm there to borrow. Bar- I'm there to borrow it okay. at 1600. And I'm going to go to Deuce Gym in, in uh, uh, early afternoon, do some rings. I really love rings and suspension stuff because it elongates the spine, mm-hmm. stretches the spine and uh, opens up the discs. Um, and it's very control oriented, oriented work, which causes you to have to, it causes one to integrate and engage instead of separate and, um, and compartmentalize. I'll do that. And then I'll get some body work, uh, which is going to be a blessing. I don't think I've had a massage probably in five or six years. I mostly just do it myself. I have a, um, a little lacrosse ball. Or I'll use my center mass bell. I'll oh, just crush okay. my damn yeah, body yeah. on that center mass bell. And I got a hurt trap. I tore my trap in rhomboid when I was a wrestler in eighth grade. This thing always gets bothers me. And I think, oh my gosh, I don't know if any of you guys out here ever have this, but you might. If you're on your phone a lot, I just recently got a tablet so I don't have to use the phone for my emails. I was finding myself in this position a lot. Mm. And it would aggravate here. Right. And so I just take that 50 pound center mass bill, put it right on my trap, uh, okay. and, just go, <laughs> and then I feel better. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and you're always traveling. Yes. Always. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Rolling Stone gathers no moss. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I have an art studio in Kansas City. My son's in St. Louis. My, my daughter's in Northern California. Between missions, I refit, refuel in Kansas City every few months. Uh, my boy Cable Gibbs out there, and and. Uh, and Travis, um, uh, Travis Stewart, he's an artist as well. Oh, and we all are athletes. And then I go see my kids. And then it's meetings and raising money for Force Blue or meetings and executing on a film set. Right now I'm developing a television show with We Are The Mighty, a production company out here. My buddy Chase, uh, Marine Corps uh, officer and Green Beret. And uh, we're working on a major uh, cable television network for my own show. So between all that, it keeps me going, keeps yeah. me going. And like, so after rocking and rolling with um, a, a fellow Marine Corps brother, um, David Wood, he's got a company called uh, Virtus in Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong doing footage and getting content for him and working on some other things that we're going to be working on together. Then I went to New York for a meeting and then right to 
Myrtle Beach and got on stage with Zach Brown as his military man that he he honored. And, yeah, I saw that. Oh my God, cool. so special. That Zach Brown again. A lot of this radiates out of that relationship I've cultivated um, with Bert Soren. Bert Soren's been there for me, uh, and, and Rick Elder, uh, Tom Davin, uh, the sport community, the military community. I got my beautiful SEAL brother Jeff Nichols, who I'm sure you know, and he's definitely somebody to have on this show. Yeah. Um, uh, and between them and Jen Wiederstrom and, and connecting to other very high level, amazing people, not just professionally, but as, 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 as Knights of the Round Table, it keeps me on the move and keeps my brain growing. And occasionally I get tired so I can sleep. So, <laughs> Do you have any, any kind of daily rituals that you have to do aside from training? Because my environment changes so much. Yeah, it's hard. Um, I really like, I will tell you what, man, you know what? When I did that ultimate survival Alaska show and I was like about 2% body fat, brother, I was fucking starving uh, because I was carrying such a load and, and uh, doing a lot of the work. Um, I got some freaking chewing tobacco from one of the freaking cats. Holy shit, do I love my chewing tobacco. Oh my goodness, I know it's bad for me, y'all. I'm working on it. Sometimes I go for a while. I don't like coffee too much anymore because it freaking hurts my stomach because uh, I abuse the shit out of it gotcha. too much in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Um, that strike force energy, though. You'll give me that little uh, pack of strike force energy, a little freaking dip in my mouth, have a good bowel movement. I'm ready to attack the day. <laughs> ready to attack the day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before, before we sign off here, you know, is there anything, I mean, you've you obviously been ultra vulnerable and, and talked about some stuff you got through. Is there anything right now that's a big obstacle for you that you're trying to figure out that you're dealing with, any, any kind of roadblock or struggle? You know, as I'm moving forward as uh, a, a warrior healer and, and uh, really maturing as a man, really, really maturing as a man, all of the pains and struggles and most of the things that have made me excellent have a history also in the hurt of my very hard childhood and the abandonment that I felt and the, and the, the, the fear. I was abused horribly, physically, sexually. Um, I was uh, uh, sick a lot. Um, I was uncared for. It gave me absolute impetus to survive, but to thrive, um, I have to assess and process and make peace with those things. And there, it's starting to happen. It's taken years. As I heal that wonderful, brave young kid, Rudy Reyes. That young kid was so brave. He did, he fought so hard against insurmountable odds. As I'm healing him, I'm healing me now. And um, I will continue on that path until I fully come home and then all the rest of my brothers and sisters come home. Amazing. You know, it's, it's not often that uh, grown adults describe a man as just a beautiful person, but I've heard that about you from five or six oh, really? people. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, that's how I would describe it. And it's, Thank it's been you, my man. such a pleasure and honor to get to know Thank you. Thank you, brother. And uh, so great to have you on here. Tell everyone where they can find out more about you, follow you on sure. social media and everything. Sure. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, RudyReyes.com. You can get on my Instagram, which is you know, completely organic, by the way. Like, I just do training and put up things that I believe in, and uh, I don't... Um, you know, I don't, I'm not working with a supplement company or selling anything. I'm just being myself because I believe in what I'm doing. And um, that's Real Rudy Reyes on Instagram. And of course, forcebluteam.org. And we have an Instagram as well, Force Blue Team on Instagram. I've got Real Rudy Reyes on Facebook. And I know it sounds kind of cliche, but if you just Google my goofy ass, you just Google Rudy Reyes, and it's a pretty common Latin name, but I'm the first guy that shows up. So you can find a way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Thank you, brother.